All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to the All Souls Community Forum coming from All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Kansas City. I'm Joe Robertson, a member of this church and also a member of the Forum Committee, a forum that for more than 75 years has sought out important conversations promoting critical thinking on the most compelling and challenging issues of our day. Today we ask the question, how can white supremacists be stopped? And that's with Leonard Zeskin, an author and activist who has spent more than 40 years on the front lines in this struggle that now features Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, and the insurrection on the nation's capital. Leonard is the author of Blood and Politics, the history of white nationalism from the margins to the mainstream. And he is a founder of the nationally known Institute for Research and Education of Human Rights. So thank you for joining us, Leonard, and welcome to the forum. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Leonard Zeskin. I'm from the Institute for Research and Education on Human Rights. Our website is www.irehr.org. That is, you might want to write this down. That is irehr.org. You can send me hate mail. I want to thank Joe Robertson and Renee Price for their help with this program. And I'm very glad to be here with you today. The last time I spoke at this forum, I think it was early 2020, I was asked to talk about the racial and demographic polarization in our society. That unfortunately has stayed very present. In fact, it is worse now today than it once was. So today, I'm going to try and give you a snapshot picture of where the white supremacist movement stands in our society and what we can do about it. Let me give you a hint. It is much worse today than at any point since I started monitoring the white supremacists in 1979. Uh, let me begin with Charlottesville, Virginia. A, uh, a 2017 Charlottesville rally grew out of a broad movement, a broad movement to, def to, uh, to defend Confederate statues. The campaign to unseat these statues had picked up steam in the last several years. They had been originally erected by the Daughters of the Confederacy in the 1890s to promote the virtues of Jim Crow segregation. Today, a broad-based anti-racism campaign was taking on racist police killings, Confederate statues, pushing against the newly installed limits on voting rights, and the defendants said they launched the United the Right rallies to defend the statue of uh, Confederate General Robert E. Lee. There was violence at the August 2017 events in Charlotte, Virginia, most notably the murder of Heather Heyer and the wounding of several others when Alex Fields drove his vehicle into the crowd of anti-racist counter-protesters. And there were several other incidents over the weekend, including a Friday night torchlight parade through the university campus. On October 28th, more than four years, more than four years after the infamous United the Right rally in Virginia, long-awaited trial for 10 white nationalists and 14 individuals began. I mean, 14 corporations began. No one from the West Coast American Freedom Party was a defendant. Neither was David Duke or non-Black. Nevertheless, the defendant's read, list read like a virtual who's who of the National Socialist, that means neo-Nazi, National Socialist wing of the white nationalist movement. Jason Kessler, the local organizer of the white, whitest rally, had been a Proud Boys member. And that organization, though not Kessler, had an outside role in the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol building. Let me just say, the, the name of the Nazi party was National Socialist German Workers Party. National Socialist German Workers Richard Spencer, the one-time leader of the National Policy Institute, was one of the bear fish in Charlottesville. He developed the word alt-right, which is a marketing term. That's all it is. 
to describe his movement and further obscure his connection to white power protests. His National Policy Institute, which was not a defendant in the case, was ordered by an Ohio court to pay $2.4 million fine in a separate legal case. He represented himself at this trial. The League of the South, its president, Michael Hill, and his chief of staff, Michael Tubbs, were all three defendants. Hill, with a PhD in history, taught British history at historically Black Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Under his leadership, the League became more activist and less sedentary. Tubbs enlisted in the U.S. Army in the 1980s and won admission to the Special Forces. But his white supremacist activism at the time caused him to be thrown in jail for several years. When released, he joined the League of the South and became its Florida chairman. He is a believer in the racist and anti-Semitic Christian identity version of Christianity. If you want to know about Christian identity, read my book. It's in there. It's a fat book. Um, and you can get it from the Institute. The Traditional Workers Party, its one-time chairman, Matthew Heimbach and Mac Matthew Perot, were also three significant defendants. Heimbach was an active white supremacist while still in college in Maryland, and Perro was affiliated with the traditional youth movement, all three steeped in, 1980, in 1930s fascist ideologies. And, and the National Socialist Movement, and it's been if you're just Shope were both defendants. Shope, Shope has stepped down as leader of the group and claims he is no longer believes in neo-Nazi tenants that have led the National Socialist Movement to march everywhere and anytime, including in KC downtown a couple of years ago. He is one of the defendants that has found it difficult to comply with plaintiff's discovery motions, getting himself and his organization in, in trouble. Identity Europa. Nathan Domingo is founder and it's Member Elliot Klein, who used the name Eli Mosley, are also three defendants, as are Vanguard America and James Alex Field, the driver of the car that plowed into a group of anti racists, killing Tether Heyer, wounding both others. Also, a couple of Klan groups and propaganda outfits accused. The verdict earlier this month was a victory for our side. Every organization. An individual was hit with substantial, and I mean substantial, monetary damages under state charges. There's going to be a fight over this. Damages that might put several of them out of business for a long time. That is very good, in my opinion. We did not win the federal conspiracy charges, however. So uh, that's uh, the stuff in Charlottesville. A bad mark. For the other side. Let us all go to the January 6th riot inside the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. An outfit at George Washington University is keeping track of all the individuals charged in this case. And the Kansas City Star has done a very good job, particularly of the ones charged in the Missouri and the Kansas area. We can thank Judy Thomas for that, reporter Judy Thomas. The average age of those arrested is 39 years old. Individuals come from 45 states and the District of Columbia. More than 700 have been arrested. Cases have been brought against 612 men and 91 women. The largest numbers came from Florida, Pennsylvania, and Texas. But we had some from right here, mid, uh, Kansas City area. The majority were charged in part using evidence from their social computers, from their social media. 81% uh, had military experience. 151 have pleaded guilty. And the sentences have tended to be light so far. Only recently did one of them get five years in jail. Now, at the time that this all occurred, I wrote an op-ed piece for the Kansas City Star last year 
for this, this, yeah, I don't know. And did listen uh, early this year, in which I pointed out that outside roles, uh, outsized roles of the Oath Keepers Militia and the Proud Boys played in the events of January 6th. Members of those organizations still face serious conspiracy charges. The Oath Keepers have lost members, going from about 30,000 members to 7,500. The Proud Boys have lost their national leaderships and today are operating solely under local control. Some have gotten more radical, uh, some not. Uh, all of them are not in Trump's back pocket. This is not a Trump operation. These guys were, were had their own goals, and they mock Trump. They mock him, along with everyone else. Now, the Attorney General for Washington, D.C. is charging, is suing, both the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers under the 1871 Anti-Klan Act. And uh, that's a good thing, I think. Um, there will be some vigorous defenses in these cases. And the outcome is not predetermined. And the government has a history uh, um, uh, 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 the outcome uh, of these is not predetermined, but the white movement has suffered greatly from the events in Charlottesville and Washington, D.C. At the same time, let us consider other organizations, particularly in the militias, that have grown very rapidly, very rapidly. Consider the People's Rights Network. This led a militia on the Oregon-Idaho border. The principals had involved in a takeover of federal lands. This is not a rare occurrence in the West. But they convened a, they convened a meeting in April of 2020, less than two years ago. They had about two dozen individuals show up. They bragged about having a mailing list of 300. Today, there are 30 3,431 individuals who are members. They run a tight ship, divided into states, regions, and city chapters, each with its own leaders. Many of the intermediate and national leaders are women, a rare occurrence for an organization steeped in this is militia culture. In Missouri, they have more than 360 members. In the immediate Kansas City, Missouri area and the suburbs, they have about 70 members. In the Springfield, southwest Missouri corner of the state, there are 120 members. They got a problem. And the, they have about 28 in Columbia Boonville. Now, how long have they grown so fast and furious? Well, uh, Simply by getting involved in what might usefully called, usefully be called the COVID denial movement against vaccine ma masks and regulations. And they are cutting turf like the Proud Boys for others. They're cutting turf for others like the Proud Boys. They're putting their guns away, putting the paramilitary training on the back burner and doing some old fashioned organizing. Stuff that you should have been doing from the other side, quite frankly. Uh, they've been involved, and there was a demonstration down at the Capitol, and you can read about it on our website, www.irehr.org. There was an organization that said, un, in which a guy shows up with a big paramilitary weapon on his. Uh, T-shirt, he says, it said, unvaccinated, but protected. That's the kind of stuff that's going on out there. And, and they're, um, so, not good. 
We are about to lose our reproductive rights. Um, we're about to lose once again on voting rights. Not good. And we are losing our own language. They've appropriated the women's movement language about our body, our, you know, controlling our bodies and our power for the anti-vax movement. Uh, and we've got to fight that. Because when they start talking like we do, People's Rights Network could be one of our organizations. Um, when they start talking like we do, the line gets very thin. The line gets very thin. Um, now, I'd like to point out something that is fairly important in the scheme of things. Um, at the turn of the century, the Kansas City Star asked me to predict what was going to happen in twenty um, in uh, in the in this century. I said that we were going to have a fight because white people were going to become a minority in a nation of minorities, and they weren't going to. Majority of white people were not going to put up with that. Well, that's what's going on. That's what's that we're in the front front stages of that, and it's going to get much worse. So um, there is wide uh, spread and still growing, still growing belief that white people are being dispossessed and going into their fathers as white people. They're being dispossessed as white people. This belief is central to the white supremacist argument. Since the gains of the broadly defined civil rights movement, this movement has believes that white people are superior, but they're being held down. Jews are doing it. Black people are holding them down. Um, and as this movement has grown and matured, this belief has spread. Now we are witnessing a attempted rollback in voting rights. Simply, be, they're going to turn Wyandotte County into District One in Kansas. Be with all the Western states, and and there's a headline in today's New York Times that the black districts are being systematically systematically put out of business by the Republicans. All right. Um, now we are witnessing an attempted rollback of voting rights. White people will quite soon actually be a voting block that's a minority in most places. They don't know how to get along with others. We are witnessing an attempted rollback of actual history teaching in the junior and senior high schools so that white people will not so feel, bad, feel so bad about committing genocide on Native Americans and enslaving Africans. And other boys treating people like of color like dog do. That's bad. The pending turnover of the road decision is so men can feel powerful again. And this list, I'm telling you, it will grow and get worse. All right. Now, uh, over the last 40 years, I have done many things to turn back the white supremacists. During the agricultural crisis and the farm crisis of the early and mid 90s, 1890s, 80s, we conducted two day day training, two day trainings, sessions for farmer and rural clergy between Ohio and Wyoming and Texas to North Carolina, everywhere. We put 1,500 people through these trainings and they became our eyes, our ears, and our hands in rural communities. It was a massive takeover undertaking and it worked it worked and we empowered some of the um, more progressive groups which uh, signed on the Jesse Jackson campaign among other things in the 1990s uh, as white power rock began to grow we began the process along with several other several working with several other groups in other countries of shutting down their music production after we had spent months tracking back their music to foreign lands. And uh, 
I was involved in suing a clan, a clan group in Blakely, Georgia, which had grown to include firemen and let black homes burn and people died. We won that case. And at every moment, at every time, we stood up and said no. In fact, that is what we did the most of. It worked. It worked. There's not enough of us standing up and saying no. But we're going to have to do much, much more today. We're going to have to sue. We're going to have to trace back their roots. We're going to have to do all the things that I just said and say no. We're going to have to do more. Much more. So uh, we're going to have to get involved in the fight over vaccines masks and regulations. If we don't do it, they win completely. Because the government cannot win that fight by itself. We're going to have to get our hands dirty. And if we don't do it, we'll lose. I just want to say, next year, uh, next year, voting rights will be an issue. There's the King family is getting involved in, in uh, some of the uh, other black organizations are doing that. Immigration will be an issue next year. The anti-immigrants will make it an issue. Every one of us will have to get, every one of us will have to get involved in these. So look for a new report for around the, the one year anniversary of January 6th. That's from WWIREHR. It will tell us how far we have to go. Thank you. Uh, Leonard Zeskin, we're listening to, we're going to take a break here before we get to the questions. And the forum will be back also next Sunday and with our annual tradition of Soapbox Sunday, where we basically offer an open mic to the public to sign up and give your uh, five minutes worth on your personal burning issues of the day. And so now to get on the playlist, you need to send an email to Craig Vollen, that's at heartwood2 at kc.rr.com. That's heartwood, H-A-R-T-W-O-O-D, the number two, at kc.rr.com. Okay, so uh, it looks like uh, George is first up. Yes, um, as you might suspect, liberals have a tendency to want to avoid uh, gunfire and, and the use of guns. And yet uh, the other side seems to be real familiar and desire the use of weapons and want to arm themselves for all sorts of reasons. Um, but do you see, I, I've been hearing of some comments about um, what a civil war is going to come. Washington Post has a big article about the civil war uh, pending. But uh, we've also seen these light sentences. Do you see a civil war more run by money and courts than guns? No, I, who knows what it'll be. I saw, um, I first saw a civil war, uh, but it might be uh, out in the culture and out in politics. Um, white supremacy is violent. And for non-white people, it's particularly violent. And there's never a time that the white supremacists are not violent. But that doesn't mean it's the only thing that they will do. There's many tendencies in this movement. And we'll, it's, uh, some will be in the courts and what you said, um, but some won't. And right now, it's being fought out in, in the, the pickets and the protests against the vaccines and way away from, from the courts. So uh, I don't know which way it's going to go. And I think people that presume to know are full of beans. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, Ethan, you're up. Hey, so um, I'm someone who's been to different anti-fascist and anti-racist uh, demonstrations. But one thing that people have always criticized about that is they say that we shouldn't counter protests. We should just stay inside and they'll go away on their own. 
Um, I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are on that. We should stay inside. Yeah, know. yeah. There's an there's an idea that it's not worth counter protesting or confronting, and that we just shouldn't pay them any attention. Which is not what I. What that I doesn't agree. work. Not okay. paying them attention does not work. All it does is give them space to grow. And we have to get active. We have to get out in the streets. And we have to get active between each other. We have to build up a movement of our own to save democracy. And uh, uh, look, there's a, there's a lot of people who say, uh, don't do nothing. Doing nothing doesn't work. Never has and never will. Okay, uh, Carol. Yeah, I thought it was particularly important that you were talking about we can't sit back and expect the government to, to uh, take on and solve the issues. Uh, maybe George Baggett would use the expression, that's what liberals did. <laughs> we often, too often do expect, oh, okay, government's going to take care of that. Um, I think that's probably true for, uh, for the three issues you mentioned or even more as they come, come up. But uh, we should be thinking about the ways that um, we can take action and talk about the issues that are important. So you mentioned talking about the line getting too thin. Um, what are the ways we can thicken the line? Uh, I, I assume there's some folks that are too far gone, but, but you know, how do we thicken the line and draw the line deeper to prevent further people getting engaged in their movement? We have to come out in favor of vaccines. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to a, a demonstration or a march that was pro-vaccine, pro-mask, and pro-regulations. We have to build up momentum. Look, we lost. Row. We're going to lose Roe because people relied on the, the government to solve these things for them. You know, the federal government was going to protect abortion rights, reproductive rights, and it hasn't. And they're taking over. And we have to fight it. And we have to fight it in our workplaces. We have to fight it uh, in our churches. We have to fight it uh, in our and on the streets. So uh, that's what I think will thicken the line. What will thicken the line is if we get active. And, and you'll know whether you're being active simply because others will be there too. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. Um, I guess uh, Nathan. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess my question is sort of about the issue of, of organizing and um, just wondered if given your years of <laughs> experience in tracking the white supremacist movement, you know, what do you think is their most powerful tool or issue that they have for uh, recruiting and organizing um, that we should be paying attention to? Well, right now, it's the vaccines and the masks. That's the most important. Six months from now, it won't be. Six months, it'll be immigration or some other issue. Look, they didn't know that, that the vaccines and the masks were going to be their most important area of growth. But it is now, and they're paying attention to it. And they're out there when the people get go down to the Union Station and have a protest. They're there. They're organizing, they're talking, and uh, six months from now, it'll be something different. And I'll let you know. You gotta stay, this is not something that stays the same. This is something where you're gonna have to pay attention to the website, get active, and just keep changing as the, as the road gets rocky. And believe me, it's going to get rockier. That's the main thing that you have to realize. White people do not like to share. The vast majority of white people do not like to share. And uh, 
They're holding on to what they got. Hey, and if I could put in a question here, uh, Leonard. Well, hold on. We'll go to, George's got a question. Go ahead, George. Yeah, uh, Leonard, I, I actually, it's more of a comment, but, uh, but what do you think about like this example of this realtor from Texas who claimed she was so white and blonde and, and uh, she was going to be, there's nothing, nobody could touch her. And then suddenly she's lost her license. She's in jail and she's lost her realtor license in Texas. So the the economic condition of, of fighting this system and being such an aberrant, beha aberrant person uh, doesn't have, it has some consequences to some individuals who think they're untouchable. What do you think about that? Well, I, I agree. It, you can get punished for, uh, look, I just, I just, Laid out the Charlotte's film and the, and the January 6th thing. The guys that got involved in that are being punished. And there are those that are not. Look, a militia is a private army. Private armies are against the law in most states. I haven't seen one of them prosecuted. Well, to follow up there, this what did they, this thing in, in Florida where DeSantis was thinking he was going to use the National Guard and then told he couldn't do so. You I mean, there, there are some positive things. You, you, you take him to court. You charge him. It's a federal, it's a state offense to run a private army. And they're running private armies. There you go. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this one out. You just got to be willing to fight. But if you don't fight, you lose. That's it. So you were talking about you know, the situation that's out there. It seems like uh, uh, that we are, and this is Joe, I'm just, I, I have a question here. Uh, the, we're in a really bad state now, as you've laid out. This, it, this is, it, it seems to be a really dark time that the concerns of civil war and all these things. Now, could we be at the peak, though? I mean, how do you, how do, what makes you think that it's going to get worse? Or could, could we be at the worst? Could we be, could there, is there a chance that things could be easing up or we could be turning anything around? Or why is it, why do you, are you, do you think you're going to get worse? They're not easing up. You're, you have the typical liberal, I want to win, but I don't want to work. I'm sorry, Joe, but doesn't work that way. And uh, uh, look, it's getting bad now. But in 2042, white people will be a, a minority and in this nation of minorities. We're going to have to learn how to share or there's going to be trouble. And there's going to be trouble. And I was at that. Uh, my wife said I could throw her on the bus. She's listening. She wanted me to ask that question for her. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, look, everybody wants to figure out how can we escape this without having to fight it. And it ain't. It doesn't work. It does not work. Those people in Charlottesville that put all those organizations on the on the rockets, um. Four years they put that lawsuit together. They raised money. They scoured the, they, they did their work. And that was a private organization that did that. And we don't know what's going to happen in January on the January 6th stuff. We know uh, it's that what the Democrats are doing is right. It has had an effect on Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell, who initially opposed the January 6th commission, just came out and said that what they're doing is, is interesting and is good, and we should publicize what they're, what they're saying. Just happened. We're going to have to fight, and we're going to have to try and win. But there's no, there's no predetermined winning. It doesn't work that way. Sorry. And uh, Ethan has another question. Go ahead. Okay, so we've talked a lot about, uh, and rightfully so, about the, the groups involved with January 6th. But uh, what about groups like um, Adam Waffen Division or Patriot Front and Thomas Rousseau, kind of these groups beyond the Trump movement? Do you see them as a threat? No, oh, they're part of the set. They're part of, look, I didn't mention Adam Waffen because they're small. But they exist. And uh, there's there's more organizations out there. There's the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, which is headquartered in Harrison, Arkansas. 
this across the border and has members all across the southwest corner of the state and a, and a, and a Dixie shop in Branson. The son of the, the founder of that clan outfit has a shop in Branson. Uh, look, there's a lot of organizations out there. We're going to have to find them all. And we're going to have to get smart. Sorry. Uh, Julie has a question. Julie, unmute. Unmute your microphone, Julie. <clears throat> I can't hear you, Julie. Hi, Lenny. Thanks for your talk. Well, this is a, a big question, but I wonder if you could just give us a a very general idea of what uh, rural training would look like now, given what you said about how the primary issues are changing. And right now it's the vaccines and masks, but next it'll be immigration. What is there what we've been a, doing model, a model there that we could start thinking about to get out into rural areas? I'm not sure I would do a two day to start with, first of all, because people have things to do. Um, and two days is hard. But uh, uh, we've been uh, working with vaxxer groups. Uh, uh, there's a coalition of vaccine groups that we've been working with and we've been speaking at their meetings. At their meetings. We're gonna have to team up with them and team up with others and other organizations. And we're gonna have to come together in a variety of organizations, get together and hold a couple of trainings and see if we can develop a model. And uh, we're gonna have to teach that people the science of vaccines. We're gonna have to teach people about white supremacy. We're gonna have to teach them how to fight it. And we're going to have to teach people how to stand up in their own community. Uh, I We've already been doing some of it some in the Northwest, uh, particularly. Um, I want to do it this year, this coming year in Missouri. And i am got plans to, to put together a couple of things in, in Missouri with other organizations. And uh, uh, if you want to do one where you are, we'll be glad to help. Um, so just let me know. All right, uh, George has another question. Yeah, I hate to hate to be the one questioning everything. Um, the, no, no, the, I, I'm glad. The, the articles that, uh, another article in the Washington Post talked about the infiltration of white supremacists in the military and that uh, they're surprised by how much is there. And that they're, the one, one of the suggestions is that they start uh, forcing their, the military to take civics classes. Um, how do you see, do you see a possibility of civics classes in, in other parts of uh, the United States to, to essentially help people uh, I think so. I think so. What do you think of the military doing this? I mean, are they, are they, listen. When when I speak in Germany, I I did a speak. I've done more than one speaking tour in Germany, and I was stopped uh, with the the crew of us that were doing it. Um, were stopped at uh at a, a former camp. Uh, I forget uh, forget which one in Germany. It was a concentration camp. It wasn't a killing camp. It was a concentration camp. There were, uh, there were troops there, troops there from Holland, Netherlands. And they were required as part of their basic training to go to the Holocaust museums and see what had happened when they had let themselves get kicked in the butt. Um... I'm not opposed to civics classes if they're anti-racist classes and include 
uh, this. It's not the first time this stuff has shown up in the uh, services. In the mid 80s, they had weapons coming off of Fort Carson, off of, uh, in Georgia, going into the movement. This, you know, they might, the Washington Post might, might be new to that reporter, but it ain't new. And uh, look, the military is the most integrated institution in the world. And those black soldiers are gonna stop this shit when it starts. So uh, that's my feeling about it. Um, and I'm glad to see it when it happens. And that, when you mentioned the military, uh, there's one thing I wanted to clarify, uh, Leonard, if I could, this is Joe, if I could step in. Because did I hear you right that uh, the uh, January 6th arrests or, or the, uh, that 80% had military experience? Did I hear that right? Uh, um, 81%, uh, 12% had uh, 81 individuals, 12% had military experience. Oh, okay. I see. And the... Um, Look, the Oath Keepers was a militia that had former police officers, police officers, and military people in it. 30,000 of them. And there's a lot of shit out there. Excuse my French. Um, there's a lot of uh, the um, individuals who have... Uh, military experience. Um, Fort Bragg is a mess. Fort Bragg is a mess. And uh, not the only mess. But uh, we got problems. It, it's not going to be in society as a whole and not be in the service. And did, now, did you say that the, uh, that the proud, but however, the the membership of Proud Boys and Oath Keepers has been declining. And then you mentioned, and I didn't quite catch the other group that you said that had now 33,000 members and uh, 360 in Missouri. Could, could you kind of clarify that again for me? The Oath Keepers have lost members. The, promise keep, the Proud Boys have not lost members or have not lost substantially members because what they've done is break up into series of local organizations and they're very active in the vaccines yes that's what the proud boys are doing vaccines masks and regulations and school boards active to put this the so-called uh critical race theory which is a bunch of whole or shit it's they want to get race out of the schools and they're doing it so is that the question? Yeah, that was that was one. And then also, the, what was the group that has now 33,000 members? They, That's they, the People's Rights Network. Grew from two dozen to 33,000 in less than two years. DSA hadn't done that. DSA has grown fast, but it hasn't grown like that. And DSA doesn't fight. Not on this issue. They like to vote. And you're so, in the school board situation. I mean, I mean, what do you know about that? Because yes, there's there's been it's a local issue. It's happening all across Kansas and Missouri, and fights on the school board. It's not it's not rocket science. We know about it. You you know about it if you read your newspaper. You don't read your newspaper. Am I right? Right now, I'm aware of the of the, uh, of the school board fights, and so I'm just and I was wondering if there's any if there's any strategies. I mean, and where else? I mean, what are the yeah school boards, vaccines? I mean, it's just amazing. I guess I just is there any any way to approach the, the school board situation? The school board is elected. They're getting on the school board because you're too busy watching instead of getting involved. Is he crud? George, George has a question. Yeah, <clears throat> again, um, it, we had black, we had the critical race theory on the forum last week. And I asked a question about the 
the educators that were uh, presenting the issue um, about the multiphasic aspect of the anti uh, understanding of black, uh, critical race theory and the history of uh, like the Tulsa event and all of it. is that the school boards, uh, the, the Texas uh, school book folks, uh, they, they have an integrated approach to maintaining the, the lie or the, or the, um, the approach to understanding the history of the United States. And, uh, and do you, it seems to me also that you're talking about us getting involved in the vaccine thing would it actually, it makes more sense to me, and maybe, maybe you do, that the, the, we go to focus on school boards. We, folk, we, we go to look at curriculums. We look at, we, because basically the way they gain members Gagas is for ignorance. Gagas up. Do it in good health. Get active on the school board issue. You do that, and I'll do the other, and we'll both, and we'll, and we'll talk together. And uh, we'll fight this fight. Gagas, don't don't decide now which one is more important. Well, I'm it. not deciding. That, I'm just saying that we need an integrated approach to it all. Is that it? Uh, yes. Yes, I agree. Okay. I agree. And now I have I if uh, I have a question back on the vaccine situation because on, on one hand there's this distress that the vaccine situation became politicized. And there, and while the, the you know there, there is the, the yes, it is being politicized, and we should help that forward. It's a public health issue, the public health issue. I, 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 well, the same as I, I think that the 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 reaction to vaccines has been to uh, to try to take it out of that politicization and make it this this is a public health issue that we all should be invested in and uh, and when you talk about protest do you do you want to make it more like a a political counter protest or is there a way to do this while still trying to take at least couch your 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 perception that no we are we are not we are not wanting to politicize this we're wanting to make this the common good and is there a risk that the common good i'm i'm all favor in favor of the common good I'm all in favor of the common good. What are you afraid of? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if there's uh, if there's and uh, and I might not. Okay, well, I'm just wondering if if, if how do these liberals are just afraid? That's that's <laughs> in shame of it. George, I'm George, sorry George. about that. Hey, well, you know, Leonard, you may you may under underestimate somebody like me. I'm not afraid of anything, um, and Who I've are been. You? I'm George Baggett. Oh, hey, George. And so let me open up my picture then to, to, um, I'm not, I'm a Vietnam veteran and I'm, and I'm feel fully capable of taking on things. Um, but the, the issue is that like uh, today's New York Times had an article about should we be recommending uh, vaccine cards for air travel? And I, and I say, yes, so I've been doing some air travel lately. And uh, here's a minor battle that could could be taken on by liberals and the people you're suggesting take on vaccine issues. Is if we stopped air travel by those who don't have vaccination cards, that could have a major impact on this is and, and this thing in the military. They, they the military also has a fairly high vaccination rate because of the mandate, and they they got rid of some guys that refused to get their vaccination and it was a fairly small amount. So I'm, look, I'm looking at that kind of battle as being the way to go about it. It's fine with me. Thank you, George. <laughs> okay. Look, if I'm for whichever way you want to do it. If you the, the, the issue way. though, the issue for me is that uh, is I'm getting older uh, I'm I'm looking for young people to start taking picking up the the other end of the tube for. Yeah, and so am I, so am I. I got a young person that's my assistant at the institute, twenty five years old. Whew. That seems young to me. When I was twenty five, I thought I was an old man. It's over. I'm old. I know it. 
And, you know, and since uh, this is Joe again, you know, and I'll add another question here. Um, and I, I do read the new, my newspaper, The Star, and, uh, and you know, Dave Helen columnist recently, he just kind of declared that uh, the American democracy is over. He says, like, the, the American democracy has ended. And he took it all the way back. It actually began 9-11. That 9-11 was really the end of the American democracy. And now we're seeing it come to fruition that we, uh, that it's broken. Is, uh, is it broken? Is there anything, what's redeemable about where our democracy is right now? Well, I, I don't think it's over. We got a fight on our hands. That's all. We got a fight on our hands. It isn't over. If it was over, uh, it would be something else. If we don't have that, it's not over. And Dave ahead. Allen doesn't know what's going on anyway. Well, we have to continue this discussion because um, in a way it's a, um, like when the problem I see with the liberals and the experience is that when 9-11 occurred and we saw these encroachments on our civil liberties, we were all opposed to what was going on, or many of us were. And, and then, and yet now we're having to kind of go back and rethink this because we were, we were attacked by what the, uh, you know, mandates of travel and, and, and TSA and, and things that we uh, historically uh, were opposed to the idea of restrictions. And now we're benefiting from them. So we're having to kind of change focus, don't you think? Uh, well, some people are. I've been sort of at it the same way. I believe that there's a three-corner battle. There's us, whoever us is. There's the fascists on the other side of the street. And there's, so there's the internationalists, that's us. There's the nationalists, that's the other team. And there's the state in the middle. It's a three-way battle. And it's not a two-way battle. No, I'm, and, uh, I agree. Um, I'm used to a two-way battle, thinking, you know, well, class war, blah, blah, blah. But it's, uh, it ain't there. It ain't there. And look, there's people organizing, poor people. There's people organizing, poor people who are workers in this city who matter. They matter, and the and the workers, the fast food workers, they matter. And um, whoever wins this, whoever wins for them, wins this. In Leonard's Joey, I'm curious. You know, so you the '79 essentials when this started out for you as. What motivated you? How did you get started into this line of work in the first place? And then what were you expecting then? Is this where you, did, could you imagine where we are now when, when you started? How'd you get started 40 years ago? And then can you imagine where we are now back then? Well, at the time there was an uptick in the Klan in the late seventies. There was an uptick in the Klan in the South. And uh, I paid attention to the South. And uh, George Baggett is right. Surely there's other questions. Um, uh, and I got involved in, in it from that standpoint. Um, I didn't think we would be here. But I didn't know where we were going. I didn't know where we were going. And I didn't know how the fight was going to go. And I'd be damned if I could predict today what it's going to be like 10 years from now when I'll be dead. So, uh, help. Yeah, go ahead, George. Okay, well, I, again, we, you've made the point, you've made the statement that I've been talking about for so long is that... Uh, I'd never expected to be 74 years old and having to deal with some of the crap that we're talking about today. Who did? I thought Who, we'd win. I thought, I thought, I thought, 68, I thought we would win. 
when I returned from the war, uh, I really thought liberals had a big upper hand, and I've been sorely disappointed by by the lack of uh, action and the idea that somebody else can do the job. And, uh, and my friend Craig Vollen and I uh, have worked on environmental issues, and one of our biggest complaints is somebody that has a great idea to tell us, you know, you should do this and you should do that. And we, and our response is, well, that'd be a great idea that you should take that on. Oh, but I'm not, I'm not a, a person that does things. I'm just an idea person. <laughs> I figured you might have a thought to that comment. <laughs> well, we need more people to do things. Yeah, that's for sure. Next Sunday, uh, we're going to have the uh, Soapbox Sunday, and this is your chance to get anyone to get on and, and, and spend about five minutes talking about what's important to you, and you do that uh, by emailing uh, Craig Bolland at heartwood2 at kc.rr.com. That's heartwood, H-A-R-T-W-O-D-2, the number two, at kcrr.com. That's next Sunday's forum. This Sunday, we had Leonard Zeskin, the human rights activist, and the uh, author and uh, we're talking about white supremacy and it's been a great conversation and i want to thank uh thank you leonard and thank everybody